Section one of Mark the Matchboy or Richard Hunter's Ward. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tori Falder. Mark the Matchboy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger Jr. Preface. Mark the Matchboy is the third volume of the Ragged Dick series, and like its predecessors, aims to describe a special phase of street life in New York. While it is complete in itself, several characters are introduced who have figured conspicuously in the preceding volumes, and the curiosity as to their future history, which has been expressed by many young readers, will be found to be gratified in the present volume. The author has observed with pleasure the increased public attention which has been drawn to the condition of these little waifs of city life by articles in our leading magazines and in other ways, and hopes that the result will be to strengthen and assist the philanthropic efforts which are making to rescue them from their vagabond condition and train them up to be useful members of society. That his own efforts have been received with so large a measure of public favor, not limited to the young readers for whom the series is especially written, the author desires to express his grateful thanks. New York, April, 1869. Mark the Matchboy or Richard Hunter's Ward. Chapter 1. Richard Hunter at Home. Fosdick, said Richard Hunter, what was the name of that man who owed your father $2,000, which he never paid him? Hiram Bates, answered Fosdick, in some surprise. What made you think of him? I thought I remembered the name. He moved out west, didn't he? So I heard at the time. Do you happen to remember where? Out west is a very large place. I do not know exactly, but I think it was Milwaukee. Indeed, exclaimed Richard Hunter, in visible excitement. Well, Fosdick, why don't you try to get the debt paid? Of what use would it be? How do I know he is living in Milwaukee now? If I should write him a letter, there isn't much chance of my ever getting an answer. Call and see him. What? Go out to Milwaukee on such a wild goose chase as that? I can't think what you are driving at, Dick. Then I'll tell you, Fosdick. Hiram Bates is now in New York. How do you know? asked Fosdick, with an expression of mingled amazement and incredulity. I'll show you. Richard Hunter pointed to the list of hotel arrivals in the Evening Express, which he held in his hand. Among the arrivals at the Astor House occurred the name of Hiram Bates from Milwaukee. If I am not mistaken, he said, that is the name of your father's debtor. I don't know, but you are right, said Fosdick thoughtfully. He must be prosperous if he stops at a high-priced hotel like the Astor. Yes, I suppose so. How much good that money would have done for my poor father, he added with a sigh. How much good it will do you, Fosdick. Fosdick shook his head. I would sell out my chance of getting it for ten dollars, he said. I would buy it at that price if I wanted to make money out of you, but I don't. I advise you to attend to this matter at once. What can I do? asked Fosdick, who seemed at a loss to understand his companion's meaning. There is only one thing to do, said Dick promptly. Call on Mr. Bates this evening at the hotel. Tell him who you are and hint that you should like the money. I haven't got your confidence, Dick. I shouldn't know how to go about it. Do you really think it would do any good? He might think I was impertinent. Impertinent to ask payment of a just debt? I don't see it in that light. I think I shall have to go with you. I wish you would. That is, if you really think there is any use in going. You mustn't be so bashful if you want to get on in the world, Fosdick. As long as there's a chance of getting even a part of it, I advise you to make the attempt. Well, Dick, I'll be guided by your advice. Two thousand dollars would be a pretty good windfall for you. That's true enough, considering that I only get eight dollars a week. I wish you got more. So do I, for one particular reason. What is that? I don't feel satisfied to have you pay ten dollars a week towards our board, while I pay only six. Didn't you promise not to say anything more about that, said Dick reproachfully. But I can't help thinking about it. If we had stayed at our old boarding house in Bleecker Street, I could have paid my full share. But this is a nicer room. Much nicer. If I only paid my half, I should be glad of the chance. Well, I'll promise you one thing. If Mr. Bates pays you the $2,000, you may pay your half of the expense. Not much chance of that, Dick. 
We can tell better after calling at the Astor House. Get on your coat and we'll start. While the boys, for the elder of the two is but eighteen, are making preparations to go out, a few explanations may be required by the reader. Those who have read Ragged Dick and Fame and Fortune, the preceding volumes of this series, will understand that less than three years before, Richard Hunter was an ignorant and ragged boot black about the streets, and Fosdick, though possessing a better education, was in the same business. By a series of upward steps, partly due to good fortune, but largely to his own determination to improve, and hopeful energy, Dick had now become a bookkeeper in the establishment of Rockwell and Cooper on Pearl Street, and possessed the confidence and good wishes of the firm in a high degree. Fosdick was two years younger, and though an excellent boy was less confident, and not so well fitted as his friend to contend with the difficulties of life, and fight his way upward. He was employed in Henderson's Hat and Cap Store on Broadway, and was at present earning a salary of eight dollars a week. As the two paid sixteen dollars weekly for their board, Fosdick would have had nothing left if he had paid his full share. But Richard Hunter at first insisted on paying eleven dollars out of the sixteen, leaving his friend but five to pay. To this Fosdick would not agree, and was with difficulty prevailed upon at last to allow Richard to pay ten. But he had always felt a delicacy about this, although he well knew how gladly his friend did it. The room which they now occupied was situated in St. Mark's Place, which forms the eastern portion of 8th Street. It was a front room on the third floor and was handsomely furnished. There was a thick carpet of tasteful figure on the floor. Between the two front windows was a handsome bureau surmounted by a large mirror. There was a comfortable sofa, chairs covered with hair cloth, a center table covered with books, crimson curtains, which gave a warm and cozy look to the room when lighted up in the evening, and all the accessories of a well-furnished room, which is used at the same time as parlor and chamber. This, with an excellent table, afforded a very agreeable home to the boys, a home which, in these days, would cost considerably more, but for which, at the time of which I write, sixteen dollars was a fair price. It may be thought that, considering how recently Richard Hunter had been a ragged boot black, content to sleep in boxes and sheltered doorways, and live at the cheapest restaurants, he had become very luxurious in his tastes. Why did he not get a cheaper boarding place and save up the difference in price? No doubt this consideration will readily suggest itself to the minds of some of my young readers. As Richard Hunter had a philosophy of his own on the subject, I may as well explain it here. He had observed that those young men who out of economy contented themselves with small and cheerless rooms, in which there was no provision for a fire, were driven in the evening to the streets, theaters, and hotels, for the comfort which they could not find at home. Here they felt obliged to spend money to an extent of which they probably were not themselves fully aware, and in the end wasted considerably more than the two or three dollars a week extra which would have provided them with a comfortable home. But this was not all. In the roaming spent outside, many laid the foundation of wrong habits, which eventually led to ruin or shortened their lives. They lost all the chances of improvement which they might have secured by study at home in the long winter evenings, and which in the end might have qualified them for posts of higher responsibility and with a larger compensation. Richard Hunter was ambitious. He wanted to rise to an honorable place in the community, and he meant to earn it by hard study. So Fosdick and he were in the habit of spending a portion of every evening in improving reading or study. Occasionally he went to some place of amusement, but he enjoyed thoroughly the many evenings when, before a cheerful fire, with books in their hands, his roommate and himself were adding to their stock of knowledge. The boys had, for over a year, taken lessons in French and mathematics, and were now able to read the French language with considerable ease. "'What's the use of moping every evening in your room?' asked a young clerk who occupied a hall bedroom adjoining. "'I don't call it moping. I enjoy it,' was the reply." You don't go to a place of amusement once a month. I go as often as I like. Well, you're a queer chap. You pay such a thundering price for board. You could go to the theater four times a week without its costing you any more if you would take a room like mine. I know it, but I'd rather have a nice, comfortable room to come home to. Are you studying for a college professor? asked the other with a sneer. I don't know, said Dick, good-humoredly, but I'm open to proposals, as the oyster remarked. If you know any first-class institution that would like a dignified professor of extensive acquirements, just mention me, will you? 
So Richard Hunter kept on his way, indifferent to the criticisms which his conduct excited in the minds of young men of his own age. He looked farther than they, and knew that if he wanted to succeed in life, and win the respect of his fellow men, he must do something else than attend theatres and spend his evenings in billiard saloons. Fosdick, who was a quiet, studious boy, fully agreed with his friend in his views of life, and by his companionship did much to strengthen and confirm Richard in his resolution. He was less ambitious than Dick, and perhaps loved study more for its own sake. With these explanations, we shall now be able to start fairly in our story. Chapter 2 at the Astor House. The two friends started from their room about seven o'clock and walked up to Third Avenue, where they jumped on board a horse car and within half an hour were landed at the foot of the City Hall Park, opposite Beekman Street. From this point, it was necessary only to cross the street to the Astor House. The Astor House is a massive pile of gray stone and has a solid look as if it might stand for hundreds of years. When it was first erected, a little more than thirty years since, it was considered far uptown, but now it is far downtown, so rapid has been the growth of the city. Richard Hunter ascended the stone steps with a firm step, but Henry Fosdick lingered behind. Do you think we had better go up, Dick? he said irresolutely. Why not? I feel awkward about it. There is no reason why you should. The money belongs to you rightfully, as the representative of your father, and it's worth trying for. I suppose you are right, but I shan't know what to say. I'll help you along if I find you need it. Come along. Those who possess energy and a strong will generally gain their point, and it was so with Richard Hunter. They entered the hotel and, ascending some stone steps, found themselves on the main floor, where the reading room, clerk's office, and dining room are located. Dick, to adopt the familiar name by which his companion addressed him, stepped up to the desk and drew towards him the book of arrivals. After a brief search, he found the name of Hiram Bates, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, towards the top of the left-hand page. Is Mr. Bates in? he inquired of the clerk, pointing to the name. I will send and inquire, if you will write your name on this card. Dick thought it would be best to send his own name, as that of Fosdick might lead Mr. Bates to guess the business on which they had come. He accordingly wrote the name Richard Hunter in his handsomest handwriting and handed it to the clerk. That functionary touched a bell. The summons was answered by a servant. James, go to number 147 and see if Mr. Bates is in. If he is, give him this card. The messenger departed at once and returned quickly. The gentleman is in and would be glad to have Mr. Hunter walk up. Come along, Fosdick, said Dick in a low voice. Fosdick obeyed, feeling very nervous. Following the servant upstairs, they soon stood before number 147. James knocked. Come in, was heard from the inside, and the two friends entered. They found themselves in a comfortably furnished room. A man of fifty-five, rather stout in build, and with iron-gray hair, rose from his chair before the fire and looked rather inquiringly. He seemed rather surprised to find that there were two visitors, as well as at the evident youth of both. Mr. Hunter, he said inquiringly, looking from one to the other. That is my name, said Dick promptly. Have I met you before? If so, my memory is at fault. No, sir, we have never met. I presume you have business with me. Be seated, if you please. First, said Dick, let me introduce my friend, Henry Fosdick. Fosdick, repeated Hiram Bates with a slight tinge of color. I think you knew my father, said Fosdick nervously. Your father was a printer, was he not? inquired Mr. Bates. Yes, sir. I do remember him. Do you come from him? Fosdick shook his head. He has been dead for two years, he said sadly. Dead? repeated Hiram Bates, as if shocked. Indeed, I am sorry to hear it. He spoke with evident regret, and Henry Fosdick, whose feelings toward his father's debtor had not been very friendly, noticed this and was softened by it. Did he die in poverty, may I ask? inquired Mr. Bates after a pause. He was poor, said Fosdick. That is, he had nothing laid up, but his wages were enough to support him and myself comfortably. Did he have any other family? No, sir. My mother died six years since, and I had no brothers or sisters. He left no property then? No, sir. Then I suppose he was able to make no provision for you? No, sir. But you probably had some relatives who came forward and provided for you. No, sir. I had no relatives in New York. 
"'What then did you do? "'Excuse my questions, but I have a motive in asking. "'My father died suddenly, having fallen from a Brooklyn ferry boat and drowned. "'He left nothing, and I knew of nothing better to do "'than go into the streets as a bootblack. "'Surely you are not in that business now,' said Mr. Bates, "'glancing at Fosdick's neat dress. "'No, sir. I was fortunate enough to find a friend. "'Here Fosdick glanced at Dick, "'who helped me along and encouraged me to apply for a place in a Broadway store. "'I have been there now for a year and a half. "'What wages do you get? "'Excuse my curiosity, but your story interests me. Eight dollars a week. "'And do you find you can live comfortably on that?' "'Yes, sir. That is, with the assistance of my friend here. "'I am glad you have a friend who is able and willing to help you.' "'It is not worth mentioning,' said Dick modestly. "'I have received as much help from him as he has from me. "'I see, at any rate, that you are good friends, "'and a good friend is worth having. "'May I ask, Mr. Fosdick, whether you ever heard your father refer to me in any way?' "'Yes, sir.' "'You are aware, then, that there were some money arrangements between us. "'I have heard him say that you had two thousand dollars of his, "'but that you failed and that it was lost. "'He informed you rightly. "'I will tell you the particulars if you are not already aware of them. "'I should be very glad to hear them, sir. "'My father died so suddenly that I never knew anything more "'than that you owed him two thousand dollars. Five years since, commenced Mr. Bates, "'I was a broker in Wall Street.' As for my business, I was expected to know the best investments. Some persons brought me money to keep for them, and I either agreed to pay them a certain rate of interest or gave them an interest in my speculations. Among the persons was your father. The way in which I got acquainted with him was this. Having occasion to get some prospectuses of a new company printed, I went to the office with which he was connected. There was some error in the printing, and he was sent to my office to speak with me about it. When our business was concluded, he waited a moment and then said, Mr. Bates, I have saved up $2,000 in the last 10 years, but I don't know much about investments, and I should consider it a favor if you would advise me. I will do so with pleasure, I said. If you desire it, I will take charge of it for you and either allow you 6% interest or give you a share of the profits I may make from investing it. Your father said that he should be glad to have me take the money for him but he would prefer regular interest to uncertain profits. The next day he brought the money and put it in my hands. To confess the truth, I was glad to have him do so, for I was engaged in extensive speculations and thought I could make use of it to advantage. For a year I paid him the interest regularly. Then there came a great catastrophe, and I found my brilliant speculations were but bubbles, which broke and left me but a mere pittance, instead of the hundred thousand dollars which I considered myself worth. Of course, those who had placed money in my hands suffered, and among them your father. I confess that I regretted his loss as much as that of any one, for I liked his straightforward manner and was touched by his evident confidence in me. Mr. Bates paused a moment and then resumed. I left New York and went to Milwaukee. Here I was obliged to begin life anew, or nearly so, for I only carried a thousand dollars out with me, but I have been greatly prospered since then. I took warning by my past failures and have succeeded, by care and good fortune, in accumulating nearly as large a fortune as the one of which I once thought myself possessed. When fortune began to smile upon me, I thought of your father, and tried through an agent to find him out. But he reported to me that his name was not to be found, either in the New York or Brooklyn directory. And I was too busily engaged to come on myself and make inquiries but I am glad to find that his son is living and that I yet have it in my power to make restitution. Fosdick could hardly believe his ears. Was he, after all, to receive the money which he had supposed irrevocably lost? As for Dick, it is not too much to say that he felt even more pleased at the prospective good fortune of his friend than if it had fallen to himself. End of section one. Recording by Tori Falder. Section 2 of Mark the Matchboy, or Richard Hunter's Ward. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tori Falder. Mark the Matchboy, or Richard Hunter's Ward, by Horatio Alger, Jr. Chapter 3. Fosdick's Fortune. 
Mr. Bates took from his pocket a memorandum book and jotted down a few figures in it. As nearly as I can remember, he said, it is four years since I ceased paying interest on the money which your father entrusted to me. The rate I agreed to pay was six per cent. How much will that amount to? Principal and interest, $2,480, said Dick promptly. Fosdick's breath was almost taken away as he heard this sum mentioned. Could it be possible that Mr. Bates intended to pay him as much as this? Why, it would be a fortune. Your figures would be quite correct, Mr. Hunter, said Mr. Bates. But for one consideration, you forgot that your friend is entitled to compound interest, as no interest has been paid for four years. Now, as you are no doubt used to figures, I will leave you to make the necessary correction. Mr. Bates tore a leaf from his memorandum book as he spoke and handed it with a pencil to Richard Hunter. Dick made a rapid calculation and reported $2,524. It seems then, Mr. Fosdick, said Mr. Bates, that I am your debtor to a very considerable amount. You are very kind, sir, said Fosdick, but I shall be quite satisfied with the $2,000 without any interest. Thank you for offering to relinquish the interest, but it is only right that I should pay it. I have had the use of the money, and I certainly would not wish to defraud you of a penny of the sum which it took your father ten years of industry to accumulate. I wish he were living now to see justice done his son. So do I, said Fosdick earnestly. I beg your pardon, sir, he said after a moment's pause. Why? asked Mr. Bates in a tone of surprise. Because, said Fosdick, I have done you injustice. I thought you failed in order to make money, and intended to cheat my father out of his savings. That made me feel hard towards you. You were justified in feeling so, said Mr. Bates. Such cases are so common that I am not surprised at your opinion of me. I ought to have explained my position to your father, and promised to make restitution whenever it should be in my power. But at the time I was discouraged and could not foresee the favorable turn which my affairs have since taken. Now, he added with a change of voice, we will arrange about the payment of this money. Do not pay it until it is convenient, Mr. Bates, said Fosdick. Your proposal is kind, but scarcely businesslike, Mr. Fosdick, said Mr. Bates. Fortunately, it will occasion me no inconvenience to pay you at once. I have not the ready money with me, as you may suppose, but I will give you a check for the amount upon the Broadway Bank with which I have an account, and it will be duly honored on presentation tomorrow. You may in return make out a receipt in full for the debt and interest. Wait a moment. I will ring for writing materials. These were soon brought by a servant of the hotel, and Mr. Bates filled in a check for the sum specified above, while Fosdick, scarcely knowing whether he was awake or dreaming, made out a receipt to which he attached his name. Now, said Mr. Bates, we will exchange documents... Fosdick took the check and deposited it carefully in his pocketbook. It is possible that payment might be refused to a boy like you, especially as the amount is so large. At what time will you be disengaged tomorrow? I am absent from the store from twelve to one for dinner. Very well. Come to the hotel as soon as you are free, and I will accompany you to the bank and get the money for you. I advise you, however, to leave it there on deposit until you have a chance to invest it. How would you advise me to invest it, sir? asked Fosdick. Perhaps you cannot do better than buy shares of some good bank. You will then have no care except to collect your dividends twice a year. That is what I should like to do, said Fosdick. What bank would you advise? The Broadway Park or Bank of Commerce are all good banks. I will attend to the matter for you, if you desire it. I should be very glad if you would, sir. Then the matter is settled, said Mr. Bates. I wish I could as easily settle another matter which has brought me to New York at this time, and which, I confess, occasions me considerable perplexity. The boys remained respectfully silent, though not without curiosity, as to what this matter might be. Mr. Bates seemed plunged in thought for a short time. Then, speaking as if to himself, he said in a low voice, Why should I not tell them? Perhaps they may help me. I believe, he said, I will take you into my confidence. You may be able to render me some assistance in my perplexing business. I shall be very glad to help you if I can, said Dick. And I also, said Fosdick. I have come to New York in search of my grandson, said Mr. Bates. Did he run away from home, asked Dick. No, he has never lived with me. Indeed, I may add that I have never seen him since he was an infant. The boys looked surprised. How old is he now, asked Fosdick. He must be about ten years old, but I see that I must give you the whole story of what is a painful passage in my life, or you will be in no position to help me. You must know, then, that twelve years since I considered myself rich and lived in a handsome house uptown. 
My wife was dead, but I had an only daughter, who I believe was generally considered attractive, if not beautiful. I had set my heart upon her making an advantageous marriage, that is, marrying a man of wealth and social position. I had in my employ a clerk of excellent business abilities and of good personal appearance, whom I sometimes invited to my house when I entertained company. His name was John Talbot. I never suspected that there was any danger of my daughter's falling in love with the young man, until one day he came to me and overwhelmed me with surprise by asking her hand in marriage. You can imagine that I was very angry. Whether justly or not, I will not pretend to say. I dismissed the young man from my employ and informed him that never, under any circumstances, would I consent to his marrying Irene. He was a high-spirited young man, and though he did not answer me, I saw by the expression of his face that he meant to persevere in his suit. A week later, my daughter was missing. She left behind a letter stating that she could not give up John Talbot, and by the time I read the letter, she would be his wife. Two days later, a Philadelphia paper was sent to me, containing a printed notice of their marriage, and the same mail brought me a joint letter from both, asking my forgiveness. I had no objections to John Talbot except his poverty, but my ambitious hopes were disappointed, and I felt the blow severely. I returned the letter to the address given, accompanied by a brief line to Irene, to the effect that I disowned her and would never more acknowledge her as my daughter. I saw her only once after that, two years after she appeared suddenly in my library, having been admitted by the servant with a child in her arms. But I hardened my heart against her, and though she besought my forgiveness, I refused it and requested her to leave the house. I cannot forgive myself when I think of my unfeeling severity, but it is too late to redeem the past. As far as I can, I would like to atone for it. A month since I heard that both Irene and her husband were dead, the latter five years since, but that the child, a boy, is still living, probably in deep poverty. He is my only descendant, and I seek to find him, hoping that he may be a joy and solace to me in the old age which will soon be upon me. It is for the purpose of tracing him that I have come to New York. When you, turning to Fosdick, referred to your being compelled to resort to the streets and the hard life of a boot black, the thought came to me that my grandson may be reduced to a similar extremity. It would be hard indeed that he should grow up ignorant, neglected, and subject to every privation, when a comfortable and even luxurious home awaits him, if he can only be found. What is his name? inquired Dick. My impression is that he was named after his father, John Talbot. Indeed, I am quite sure that my daughter wrote me to this effect in a letter which I returned after reading. Have you reason to think he is in New York? My information is that his mother died here a year since. It is not likely that he has been able to leave the city. He is about ten years old. I used to know most of the boot blacks and newsboys when I was in the business, said Dick reflectively, but I cannot recall that name. Were you ever in the business, Mr. Hunter? asked Mr. Bates in surprise. Yes, said Richard Hunter, smiling. I used to be one of the most ragged boot blacks in the city. Don't you remember my Washington coat and Napoleon pants, Fosdick? I remember them well. Surely that was many years ago. It is not yet two years since I gave up blacking boots. You surprise me, Mr. Hunter, said Mr. Bates. I congratulate you on your advance in life. Such a rise shows remarkable energy on your part. I was lucky, said Dick modestly. I found some good friends who helped me along. But about your grandson, I have quite a number of friends among the street boys, and I can inquire of them whether any boy named John Talbot has joined their ranks since my time. I shall be greatly obliged to you if you will, said Mr. Bates, but it is quite possible that circumstances may have led to a change of name, so that it will not do to trust too much to this. Even if no boy bearing the name is found, I shall feel that there is this possibility in my favor. That is true, said Dick. It is very common for boys to change their name. Some can't remember whether they ever had any names, and pick out one to suit themselves, or perhaps get one from those they go with. There was one boy I knew named Horace Greeley. Then there were Fat Jack, Pickle Nose, Cranky Jim, Tickle Me Foot, and plenty of others. You knew some of them, didn't you, Fosdick? I knew Fat Jack and Tickle Me Foot, answered Fosdick. This, of course, increases the difficulty of finding and identifying the boy, said Mr. Bates. Here, he said, taking a card photograph from his pocket is a picture of my daughter at the time of her marriage. I have had these taken from a portrait in my possession. Can you spare me one, asked Dick. It may help me to find the boy. I will give one to each of you. I need not say that I shall feel most grateful for any service you may be able to render me, and will gladly reimburse any expenses you may incur, besides paying you liberally for your time. It will be better, perhaps, for me to leave fifty dollars with each of you to defray any expenses you may be at. Thank you, said Dick. 
but I am well supplied with money and will advance whatever is needful, and if I succeed, I will hand in my bill. Fosdick expressed himself in a similar way, and after some further conversation, he and Dick rose to go. I congratulate you on your wealth, Fosdick, said Dick, when they were outside. You're richer than I am now. I never should have got this money but for you, Dick. I wish you'd take some of it. Well, I will. You may pay my fare home on the horse cars. But really, I wish you would. But this Dick positively refused to do, as might have been expected. He was himself the owner of two uptown lots, which he eventually sold for $5,000, although they only cost him one, and had $300 besides in the bank. He agreed, however, to let Fosdick henceforth bear his share of the expenses of board, and this added $2 a week to the sum he was able to lay up. Chapter 4. A Difficult Commission It need hardly be said that Fosdick was punctual to his appointment at the Astor House on the following day. He found Mr. Bates in the reading room looking over a Milwaukee paper. "'Good morning, Mr. Fosdick,' he said, extending his hand. "'I suppose your time is limited. Therefore, it will be best for us to go at once to the bank.' "'You are very kind, sir, to take so much trouble on my account,' said Fosdick. "'We ought all to help each other,' said Mr. Bates. "'I believe in that doctrine, though I have not always lived up to it. "'On second thoughts,' he added as they got out in front of the hotel, "'if you approve of my suggestions about the purchase of bank shares, "'it may not be necessary to go to the bank, as you can take this check in payment.' Just as you think best, sir, I can depend upon your judgment, as you know much more of such things than I. Then we will go at once to the office of Mr. Ferguson, a Wall Street broker, and an old friend of mine. There we will give an order for some bank shares. Together the two walked down Broadway until they reached Trinity Church, which fronts the entrance to Wall Street. Here then they crossed the street and soon reached the office of Mr. Ferguson. Mr. Ferguson, a pleasant-looking man with sandy hair and whiskers, came forward and shook Mr. Bates cordially by the hand. "'Glad to see you, Mr. Bates,' he said. "'Where have you been for the last four years?' "'In Milwaukee. I see you are at the old place. "'Yes, plodding along as usual. How do you like the West?' "'I have found it a good place for business, "'though I am not sure whether I like it as well to live in as New York. "'Shan't you come back to New York sometime?' "'Mr. Bates shook his head. "'My business ties me to Milwaukee,' he said. "'I doubt if I ever return.' "'Who is this young man?' said the broker, looking at Fosdick. "'He is not a son of yours, I think.' "'No, I am not fortunate enough to have a son. "'He is a young friend who wants a little business done in your line, "'and I have accordingly brought him to you. "'We will do our best for him. What is it?' "'He wants to purchase 20 shares in some good city bank. "'I used to know all about such matters when I lived in the city, "'but I am out of the way of such knowledge now. Twenty shares, you said? Yes. "'It happens quite oddly that a party brought in only 15 minutes since "'twenty shares in the bank to dispose of. "'It is a good bank.' and I don't know that he can do any better than take them. Yes, it is a good bank. What interest does it pay now? Eight percent. That is good. What is the market value of the stock? It is selling this morning at one hundred and twenty. Twenty shares, then, will amount to twenty-four hundred dollars. Precisely. Well, perhaps we'd better take them. What do you say, Mr. Fosdick? If you advise it, sir, I shall be very glad to do so. Then the business can be accomplished at once, as the party left us his signature authorizing the transfer. The transfer was rapidly effected. The broker's commission of 25 cents per share amounted to $5. It was found on paying this, added to the purchase money, that $119 remained, the check being for $2,524. The broker took the check and returned this sum, which Mr. Bates handed to Fosdick. You may need this for a reserve fund, he said, to draw upon if needful until your dividend comes due. The bank shares will pay you probably $160 per year. One hundred and sixty dollars repeated Fosdick in surprise. That is a little more than three dollars a week. Yes, it will be very acceptable as my salary at the store is not enough to pay my expenses. I would advise you not to break in upon your capital if you can avoid it, said Mr. Bates. By and by, if your salary increases, you may be able to add the interest yearly to the principal so that it may be accumulating till you are a man when you may find it of use in setting you up in business. Yes, sir, I will remember that, but I can hardly realize that I am really the owner of 20 bank shares. No doubt it seems sudden to you. Don't let it make you extravagant. Most boys of your age would need a guardian, but you have had so much experience in taking care of yourself that I think you can get along without one. I have my friend Dick to advise me, said Fosdick. Mr. Hunter seems quite a remarkable young man, said Mr. Bates. I can hardly believe that his past history has been as he gave it. It is strictly true, sir. Three years ago, he could not read or write. 
If he continues to display the same energy, I can predict for him a prominent position in the future. I am glad to hear you say so, sir. Dick is a very dear friend of mine. Now, Mr. Fosdick, it is time you were thinking of dinner. I believe this is your dinner hour. Yes, sir. And it is nearly over. You must be my guest today. I know of a quiet little lunchroom nearby, which I used to frequent some years ago when I was in business on this street. We will drop in there, and I think you will be able to get through in time. Fosdick could not well decline the invitation, but accompanied Mr. Bates to the place referred to, where he had a better meal than he was accustomed to. It was finished in time, for as the clock on the city hall struck one, he reached the door of Henderson's store. Fosdick could not very well banish from his mind the thoughts of his extraordinary change of fortune, and I am obliged to confess that he did not discharge his duties quite as faithfully as usual that afternoon. I will mention one rather amusing instance of his preoccupation of mind. A lady entered the store, leading by the hand her son Edwin, a little boy of seven. "'Have you any hats that will fit my little boy?' she said." "'Yes, ma'am,' said Fosdick absently, and brought forward a large-sized man's hat of the kind popularly known as stovepipe. "'How will this do?' asked Fosdick. "'I don't want to wear such an ugly hat as that,' said Edwin in dismay. The lady looked at Fosdick as if she had very strong doubts of his sanity. He saw his mistake, and coloring deeply, said in a hurried tone, "'Excuse me, I was thinking of something else.' The next selection proved more satisfactory, and Edwin went out of the store feeling quite proud of his new hat. Towards the close of the afternoon, Fosdick was surprised at the entrance of Mr. Bates. He came up to the counter where he was standing and said, I am glad I have found you in. I was not quite sure if this was the place where you were employed. I am glad to see you, sir, said Fosdick. I have just received a telegram from Milwaukee, said Mr. Bates, summoning me home immediately on matters connected with business. I shall not therefore be able to remain here to follow up the search upon which I had entered. As you and your friend have kindly offered your assistance, I am going to leave the matter in your hands, and will authorize you to incur any expenses you may deem advisable, and I will gladly reimburse you whether you succeed or not. Fosdick assured him that they would spare no efforts, and Mr. Bates, after briefly thanking him and giving him his address, hurried away, as he had determined to start on his return home that very night. End of section 2. Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward. Recording by Tori Falder. Section 3 of Mark the Matchboy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tori Falder. Chapter 5. Introduces Mark the Matchboy. It was growing dark, though yet scarcely six o'clock, for the day was one of the shortest in the year, when a small boy, thinly clad, turned down Frankfort Street on the corner opposite French's Hotel. He had come up Nassau Street, passing the Tribune office and the old Tammany Hall, now superseded by the substantial new Sun building. He had a box of matches under his arm, of which very few seemed to have been sold. He had a weary, spiritless air and walked as if quite tired. He had been on his feet all day and was faint with hunger, having eaten nothing but an apple to sustain his strength. The thought that he was near his journey's end did not seem to cheer him much. Why this should be so will speedily appear. He crossed William Street, passed Gold Street, and turned down Vanderwater Street, leading out of Frankfort Street on the left. It is in the form of a short curve connecting with that most crooked of all New York avenues, Pearl Street. He paused in front of a shabby house and went upstairs. The door of a room on the third floor was standing ajar. He pushed it open and entered, not without a kind of shrinking. A coarse-looking woman was seated before a scanty fire. She had just thrust a bottle into her pocket after taking a copious draught therefrom, and her flushed face showed that this had long been a habit with her. "'Well, Mark, what luck tonight?' she said in a husky voice. "'I didn't sell much,' said the boy. "'Didn't sell much? Come here,' said the woman sharply. Mark came up to her side, and she snatched the box from him angrily. "'Only three boxes gone,' she repeated. "'What have you been doing all day?' She added to the question a coarse epithet, which I shall not repeat. "'I tried to sell them. Indeed I did, Mother Watson. Indeed I did,' said the boy earnestly. "'But everybody had bought them already.' "'You didn't try,' said the woman, addressed as Mother Watson. "'You're too lazy. That's what's the matter. You don't earn your salt. Now give me the money.' Mark drew from his pocket a few pennies and handed to her. She counted them over and then, looking up sharply, said with a frown, "'There's a penny short. Where is it?' "'I was so hungry,' pleaded Mark, "'that I bought an apple. Only a little one.' 
"'You bought an apple, did you?' said the woman menacingly. "'So that's the way you spend my money, you little thief!' "'I was so faint and hungry,' again pleaded the boy. "'What business had you to be hungry? "'Didn't you have some breakfast this morning?' "'I had a piece of bread.' "'That's more than you earned. "'You'll eat me out of house and home, you little thief. "'But I'll pay you off. "'I'll give you something to take away your appetite. "'You won't be hungry any more, I reckon.' She dove her flabby hand into her pocket and produced a strap, at which the boy gazed with frightened look. "'Don't beat me, Mother Watson,' he said imploringly. "'I'll beat the laziness out of you,' said the woman vindictively. "'See if I don't.' She clutched Mark by the collar and was about to bring the strap down forcibly upon his back, ill protected by his thin jacket when a visitor entered the room. "'What's the matter, Mrs. Watson?' asked the intruder. "'Oh, it's you, Mrs. Flanagan,' said the woman, holding the strap suspended in the air. "'I'll tell you what's the matter. "'This little thief has come home after selling only three boxes of matches the whole day, "'and I find he stole a penny to buy an apple with. "'It's for that I'm going to beat him.' "'Oh, let him alone, the poor lad,' said Mrs. Flanagan, who was a warm-hearted Irish woman. "'Maybe he was hungry. "'Then why didn't he work? "'Them that work can eat. "'Maybe people didn't want to buy.' "'Well, I can't afford to keep him in his idleness,' said Mrs. Watson. "'He may go to bed without his supper. "'If he can't sell his matches, maybe people will give him something.' Mrs. Watson evidently thought favorably of this suggestion, for turning to Mark, she said, "'Go out again, you little thief, and mind you don't come in again till you've got twenty-five cents to bring me. "'Do you mind that?' Mark listened, but stood irresolute. "'I don't like to beg,' he said." "'Don't like to beg,' screamed Mrs. Watson. "'Do you mind that now, Mrs. Flanagan? "'He's too proud to beg.' "'Mother told me never to beg if I could help it,' said Mark. "'Well, you can't help it,' said the woman, "'flourishing the strap in a threatening manner. "'Do you see this?' "'Yes. "'Well, you'll feel it, too, if you don't do as I tell you. "'Go out now.' "'I'm so hungry,' said Mark. "'Won't you give me a piece of bread?' "'Not a mouthful till you bring back twenty-five cents. "'Start now or you'll feel the strap.' "'The boy left the room with a slow step "'and wearily descended the stairs. "'I hope my young readers will never know "'the hungry craving after food "'which tormented the poor little boy "'as he made his way towards the street. "'But he had hardly reached the foot of the first staircase "'when he heard a low voice behind him, "'and turning beheld Mrs. Flanagan, "'who hastily followed after him. "'Are you very hungry?' she asked. "'Yes, I'm faint with hunger.' "'Poor boy,' she said compassionately. "'Come in here a minute.' She opened the door of her own room, which was just at the foot of the staircase, and gently pushed him in. It was a room of the same general appearance as the one above, but was much neater looking. Biddy Flanagan isn't the woman to let a poor motherless child go hungry when she's a bit of bread or meat by her. "'Here, Mark, lad, sit down, and I'll soon bring you something that'll warm your poor stomach.' She opened a cupboard and brought out a plate containing a small quantity of cold beef and two slices of bread. There's some better meat than you'll get of Mother Watson. It's cold, but it's good. She never gives me any meat at all, said Mark, gazing with a look of eager anticipation at the plate, which to his famished eye looked so inviting. I'll be bound she don't, said Mrs. Flanagan. Talk of you being lazy. What does she do herself but sit all day doing nothing except drink whiskey from the black bottle? She might get washing to do as I do if she wanted to, but she won't work. She expects you to get money enough for both of you. Meanwhile, Mrs. Flanagan had poured out a cup of tea from an old tin teapot that stood on the stove. There, drink that, Mark, dear, she said. It'll warm you up and you'll need it this cold night, I'm thinking. The tea was not of the best quality and the cup was cracked and discolored, but to Mark it was grateful and refreshing and he eagerly drank it. "'Is it good?' asked the sympathizing woman, observing with satisfaction the eagerness with which it was drunk. "'Yes, it makes me feel warm,' said Mark. "'It's better nor the whiskey Mother Watson drinks,' said Mrs. Flanagan. "'It won't make your nose red like hers. It would be a sight better for her if she'd throw away the whiskey and take to the tea.' "'You are very kind, Mrs. Flanagan,' said Mark, rising from the table, feeling fifty percent better than when he sat down." "'Oh, bother now. Don't say a word about it. Sure you're welcome to the bit you've eaten and the little sup of tea. Come in again when you feel hungry, and Bridget Flanagan won't be the woman to send you off hungry if she's got anything in the cupboard. I wish Mother Watson was as good as you are,' said Mark. "'I ain't so good as I might be,' said Mrs. Flanagan. "'But I wouldn't be guilty of treating a poor boy as that woman treats you. More shame to her. How came you with her anyway? She ain't your mother, is she?' "'No,' said Mark, shuddering at the bare idea.' 
My mother was a good woman and worked hard. She didn't drink whiskey. Mother was always kind to me. I wish she was alive now. When did she die, Mark, dear? It's going on a year since she died. I didn't know what to do, but Mother Watson told me to come and live with her and she'd take care of me. Sorry a bit of kindness there was in that, commented Mrs. Flanagan. She wanted you to take care of her. Well, and what did she make you do? She sent me out to earn what I could. Sometimes I would run on errands, but lately I have sold matches. Is it hard work selling them? Sometimes I do pretty well, but some days it seems as if nobody wanted any. Today I went round to a great many offices, but they all had as many as they wanted, and I didn't sell but three boxes. I tried to sell more, indeed I did, but I couldn't. No doubt you did, Mark, dear. It's cold you must be in that thin jacket of yours this cold weather. I've got a shawl you may wear if you like. You'll not lose it, I know. But Mark had a boy's natural dislike to being dressed as a girl, knowing, moreover, that his appearance in the street with Mrs. Flanagan's shawl would subject him to the jeers of the street boys. So he declined the offer with thanks, and buttoning up his thin jacket, descended the remaining staircase, and went out again into the chilling and uninviting street. A chilly, drizzling rain had just set in, and this made it even more dreary than it had been during the day. Chapter 6. Ben Gibson but it was not so much the storm or the cold weather that Mark cared for. He had become used to these, so far as one can become used to what is very disagreeable. If after a hard day's work he had had a good home to come back to, or a kind and sympathizing friend, he would have had that thought to cheer him up. But Mother Watson cared nothing for him, except for the money he brought her, and Mark found it impossible either to cherish love or respect for the coarse woman whom he generally found more or less affected by whiskey. Cold and hungry as he had been oftentimes, he had always shrunk from begging. It seemed to lower him in his own thoughts to ask charity of others. Mother Watson had suggested it to him once or twice, but had never actually commanded it before. Now he was required to bring home twenty-five cents. He knew very well what would be the result if he failed to do this. Mother Watson would apply the leather strap with merciless fury, and he knew that his strength was as nothing compared to hers. So, for the first time in his life, he felt that he must make up his mind to beg. He retraced his steps to the head of Frankfort Street and walked slowly down Nassau Street. The rain was falling, as I have said, and those who could remained under shelter. Besides, business hours were over. The thousands who, during the day, made the lower part of the city a busy hive had gone to their homes in the upper portion of the island, or across the river to Brooklyn, or to the towns on the Jersey Shore. So, however willing he might be to beg, there did not seem to be much chance at present. The rain increased, and Mark in his thin clothes was soon drenched to the skin. He felt damp, cold, and uncomfortable. But there was no rest for him. The only home he had was shut to him, unless he should bring home twenty-five cents, and of this there seemed very little prospect. At the corner of Fulton Street he fell in with a boy of twelve, short and sturdy in frame, dressed in a coat whose tails nearly reached the sidewalk. Though scarcely in the fashion, it was warmer than Mark's, and the proprietor troubled himself very little about the looks. This boy, whom Mark recognized as Ben Gibson, had a clay pipe in his mouth, which he seemed to be smoking with evident enjoyment. "'Where are you going?' he asked, halting in front of Mark. "'I don't know,' said Mark. "'Don't know,' repeated Ben, taking his pipe from his mouth and spitting. "'Where's your matches?' "'I left them at home. "'Then what did you come out for in this storm?' The woman I live with won't let me come home till I've brought her twenty-five cents. How'd you expect to get it? She wants me to beg. That's a good way, said Ben approvingly. When you get hold of a soft chap or a lady, them's the ones to shell out. I don't like it, said Mark. I don't want people to think me a beggar. What's the odds, said Ben philosophically. You're just the chap to make a good beggar. What do you mean by that, Ben, said Mark, who was far from considering this much of a compliment. "'Why, you're a thin, pale little chap that people will pity easy. "'Now I ain't the right cut for a beggar. "'I tried it once, but it was no go.' "'Why not?' asked Mark, who began to be interested in spite of himself. "'You see,' said Ben, again puffing out a volume of smoke, "'I look too tough, as if I could take care of myself. "'People don't pity me. "'I tried it one night when I was hard up. "'I hadn't got but six cents, and I wanted to go to the old Bowery bad.' So I went up to a gent as was coming up Wall Street from the ferry and said, Won't you give a poor boy a few pennies to save him from starving? So you're almost starving, are you, my lad? says he. Yes, sir, says I, as faint as I could. Well, starving seems to agree with you, says he, laughing. You're the healthiest-looking beggar I've seen in a good while. 
I tried it again on another gent, and he told me he guessed I was lazy, that a good stout boy like me ought to work. So I didn't make much begging and had to give up going to the old Bowery that night, which I was precious sorry for, for there was a great benefit that evening. Been there often? No, I never went. Never went to the old Bowery, ejaculated Ben, whistling in his amazement. Where were you raised, I'd like to know. I should think you was a country greenie, I should. I never had a chance, said Mark, who began to feel a little ashamed of the confession. Won't your old woman let you go? I never have any money to go. If I was flush, I'd take you myself. It's only fifteen cents, said Ben, but I haven't got money enough only for one ticket. I'm going tonight. Are you? asked Mark, a little enviously. Yes, it's a good way to pass a rainy evening. You've got a warm room to be in, let alone the play, which is splendid. Now, if you could only beg fifteen cents for some charitable cove, you might go along with me. If I get any money, I've got to carry it home. Suppose you don't. Will the old woman cut you up rough? She'll beat me with a strap, said Mark, shuddering. What makes you let her do it? demanded Ben, rather disdainfully. I can't help it. She wouldn't beat me, said Ben decidedly. What would you do? asked Mark with interest. "'What would I do?' retorted Ben. "'I'd kick and bite and give her one for herself between the eyes. "'That's what I'd do. "'She'd find me a hard case, I reckon.' "'It wouldn't be any use for me to try that,' said Mark. "'She's too strong.' "'It don't take much to handle you,' said Ben, "'taking a critical survey of the physical points of Mark. "'You're most light enough to blow away.' "'I'm only ten years old,' said Mark apologetically. "'I shall be bigger sometime.' "'Maybe,' said Ben dubiously but you don't look as if you'd ever be tough like me. There, he added after a pause, I've smoked all my backy. I wish I'd got some more. Do you like to smoke? asked Mark. It warms a feller up, said Ben. It's just the thing for a cold, wet day like this. Didn't you ever try it? No. If I'd got some backy here, I'd give you a whiff, but I think it would make you sick the first time. I don't think I would like it, said Mark, who had never felt any desire to smoke, though he knew plenty of boys who indulged in the habit. "'That's because you don't know nothing about it,' remarked Ben. "'I didn't like it at first till I got learned. "'Do you smoke often?' "'Every day after I get through black and boots. "'That is, when I ain't hard up and can't raise the stamps to pay for the backy. "'But I guess I'll be going up to the old Bowery. "'It's most time for the doors to open. "'Where are you going?' "'I don't know where to go,' said Mark helplessly. "'I'll tell you where you'd better go. "'You won't find nobody around here. "'Besides, it ain't comfortable letting the rain fall on you and wet you through.' While this conversation was going on, the boys had sheltered themselves in a doorway. Just you go down to Fulton Market. There you'll be out of the wet, and you'll see plenty of people passing through when the boats come in. Maybe some of them will give you something. Then again, there's the boats. Some nights, I sleep aboard the boats. You do? Will they let you? They don't notice. I just pay my two cents and go aboard and snuggle up in a corner and go to sleep. So I ride to Brooklyn and back all night. That's cheaper than the newsboy's lodging house, for it only costs two cents. One night a gentleman came to me and woke me up and said, We've got to Brooklyn, my lad. If you don't get up, they'll carry you back again. I jumped up and told him I was much obliged, as I didn't know what my family would say if I didn't get home by eleven o'clock. Then, just as soon as his back was turned, I sat down again and went to sleep. It ain't so bad sleeping aboard the boat, especially in a cold night. They keep the cabin warm, and though the seat isn't particularly soft, it's better than being out in the street. If you don't get your twenty-five cents and are afraid of a lickin', you'd better sleep aboard the boat. Perhaps I will, said Mark, to whom the idea was not unwelcome, for it would at all events save him for that night from the beating, which would be his portion if he came home without the required sum. Well, good night, said Ben. I'll be going along. Good night, Ben, said Mark. I guess I'll go to Fulton Market. Accordingly, Mark turned down Fulton Street, while Ben steered in the direction of Chatham Street, through which it was necessary to pass in order to reach the theater, which is situated on the Bowery, not far from its junction with Chatham Street. Ben Gibson is a type of numerous class of improvident boys, who live on from day to day, careless of appearances, spending their evenings where they can, at the theater when their means admit, and sometimes at gambling saloons. Not naturally bad, they drift into bad habits from the force of outward circumstances. They early learn to smoke or chew, finding in tobacco some comfort during the cold and wet days, either ignorant of or indifferent to the harm which the insidious weed will do to their constitutions. So their growth is checked, or their blood is impoverished, as is shown by their pale faces. As for Ben, he was gifted with a sturdy frame and an excellent constitution, and appeared as yet to exhibit none of the baneful effects of this habit. But no growing boy can smoke without ultimately being affected by it, and such will no doubt be the case with Ben.
End of section three. Recording by Tori Felder. Section 4 of Mark the Match Boy, or Richard Hunter's Ward, by Horatio Alger, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tori Falter. Chapter 7. Fulton Market. Just across from Fulton Ferry stands Fulton Market. It is nearly 50 years old, having been built in 1821 on ground formerly occupied by unsightly wooden buildings, which were perhaps fortunately swept away by fire. It covers the block bounded by Fulton, South, Beekman, and Front Streets, and was erected at a cost of about quarter of a million dollars. This is the chief of the great city markets, and an immense business is done here. There is hardly an hour in the 24 in which there is an entire lull in the business of the place. Some of the outside shops and booths are kept open all night, while the supplies of fish, meats, and vegetables for the market proper are brought at a very early hour, almost before it can be called morning. Besides the market proper, the surrounding sidewalks are roofed over and lined with shops and booths of the most diverse character, at which almost every conceivable article can be purchased. Most numerous, perhaps, are the chief restaurants, the counters loaded with cakes and pies, with a steaming vessel of coffee smoking at one end. The floors are sanded, and the accommodations are far from elegant or luxurious. But it is said that the viands are by no means to be despised. Then there are fruit stalls with tempting heaps of oranges, apples, and in their season the fruits of summer, presided over for the most part by old women, who scan shrewdly the faces of passers-by and are ready on the smallest provocation to vaunt the merits of their wares. There are candy and coconut cakes for those who have a sweet tooth, and many a shop boy invests in these on his way to or from Brooklyn to the New York store where he is employed or the father of a family on his way to his Brooklyn home thinks of the little ones awaiting him and indulges in a purchase of what he knows will be sure to be acceptable to them. But it is not only the wants of the body that are provided for at Fulton Market. On the Fulton Street side may be found extensive booths, at which are displayed for sale a tempting array of papers, magazines, and books, as well as stationery, photograph albums, etc., generally at prices 20 or 30 percent lower than is demanded for them in the more pretentious Broadway or Fulton Avenue stores. Even at night, therefore, the outer portion of the market presents a bright and cheerful shelter from the inclement weather, being securely roofed over and well lighted, while some of the booths are kept open, however late the hour. Ben Gibson, therefore, was right in directing Mark to Fulton Market as probably the most comfortable place to be found in the pouring rain, which made the thoroughfares dismal and dreary. Mark, of course, had been in Fulton Market often, and saw at once the wisdom of the advice. He ran down Fulton Street as fast as he could, and arrived there panting and wet to the skin. Uncomfortable as he was, the change from the wet streets to the bright and comparatively warm shelter of the market made him at once more cheerful. In fact, it compared favorably with the cold and uninviting room which he shared with Mother Watson. As Mark looked around him, he could not help wishing that he tended in one of the little restaurants that looked so bright and inviting to him. Those who are accustomed to lunch at Delmonico's, or at some of the large and stylish hotels, or have their meals served by attentive servants in brownstone dwellings in the more fashionable quarters of the city, would be likely to turn up their noses at his humble taste, and would feel it an infliction to take a meal amid such plebeian surroundings. But then Mark knew nothing about the fair at Delmonico's, and was far enough from living in a brownstone front and so his ideas of happiness and luxury were not very exalted, or he would scarcely have envied a stout butcher boy, whom he saw sitting at an unpainted wooden table, partaking of a repast which was more abundant than choice. But from the surrounding comfort, Mark's thoughts were brought back to the disagreeable business which brought him here. He was to solicit charity from some one of the passers-by, and with a sigh he began to look about him to select some compassionate face. If there was only somebody here that wanted an errand done, he thought, and would pay me 25 cents for doing it, I wouldn't have to beg. I'd rather work two hours for the money than beg it. But there seemed little chance of this. In the busy portion of the day, there might have been some chance, though this would be uncertain. But now it was very improbable. If he wanted to get 25 cents that night, he must get it from charity. A beginning must be made, however disagreeable. So Mark went up to a young man who was passing along on his way to the boat, and in a shamefaced manner said, "'Will you give me a few pennies, please?' The young man looked good-natured, and it was that which gave Mark confidence to address him. "'You want some pennies, do you?' he said with a smile, pausing in his walk. "'If you please, sir. I suppose your wife and family are starving, eh?' "'I haven't got any wife or family, sir,' said Mark. 
But you've got a sick mother or some brothers or sisters that are starving, haven't you? No, sir. Then I'm afraid you're not up to your business. How long have you been round begging? Never before, said Mark, rather indignantly. Ah, that accounts for it. You haven't learned the business yet. After a few weeks, you'll have a sick mother starving at home. They all do, you know. My mother is dead, said Mark. I shan't tell a lie to get money. Come, you're rather a remarkable boy, said the young man, who was a reporter on a daily paper, going over to attend a meeting in Brooklyn, to write an account to appear in one of the city dailies in the morning. I don't generally give money in such cases, but I must make an exception in your case. He drew a dime from his vest pocket and handed it to Mark. Mark took it with a blush of mortification at the necessity. I wouldn't beg if I could help it, he said, desiring to justify himself in the eyes of the good-natured young man. I'm glad to hear that, Johnny. Johnny is a common name applied to boys whose names are unknown. It isn't a very creditable business. What makes you beg, then? I shall be beaten if I don't, said Mark. That's bad. Who will beat you? Mother Watson. Tell Mother Watson, with my compliments, that she's a wicked old tyrant. I'll tell you what, my lad. You must grow as fast as you can, and by and by you'll get too large for that motherly old woman to whip. But there goes the bell. I must be getting aboard. This was the result of Mark's first begging appeal. He looked at the money and wished he had got it in any other way. If it had been the reward of an hour's work, he would have gazed at it with much greater satisfaction. Well, he had made a beginning. He had got ten cents, but there still remained fifteen cents to obtain, and without that he did not feel safe in going back. So he looked about him for another person to address. This time he thought he would ask a lady. Accordingly, he went up to one who was walking with her son, a boy of sixteen, to judge from appearance, and asked for a few pennies. "'Get out of my way, you little beggar,' she said in a disagreeable tone. "'Ain't you ashamed of yourself going round begging instead of earning money like honest people?' "'I've been trying to earn money all day,' said Mark, rather indignant at this attack. "'Oh, no doubt,' sneered the woman. "'I don't think you'll hurt yourself with work.' "'I was round the streets all day trying to sell matches,' said Mark. "'You mustn't believe what he says, mother,' said the boy. "'They're all a set of humbugs and will lie as fast as they can talk.' "'I have no doubt of it, Roswell,' said Mrs. Crawford. "'Such little impostors never get anything out of me. "'I've got other uses for my money.' Mark was a gentle, peaceful boy, but such attacks naturally made him indignant. "'I am not an impostor, and I neither lie nor steal,' he said, looking alternately from the mother to the son. "'Oh, you're a fine young man, I've no doubt,' said Roswell with a sneer. "'But we'd better be getting on, mother, unless you mean to stop in Fulton Market all night.' So mother and son passed on, leaving Mark with a sense of mortification and injury. He would have given the ten cents he had not to have asked charity of this woman who had answered him so unpleasantly. Those of my readers who have read the two preceding volumes of this series will recognize in Roswell Crawford and his mother old acquaintances who played an important part in the former stories. As, however, I may have some new readers, it may be as well to explain that Roswell was a self-conceited boy who prided himself on being the son of a gentleman and whose great desire was to find a place where the pay would be large and the duties very small. Unfortunately for his pride, his father had failed in business shortly before he died, and his mother had been compelled to keep a boarding house. She, too, was troubled with a pride very similar to that of her son, and chafed inwardly at her position, instead of reconciling herself to it, as many better persons have done. Roswell was not very fortunate in retaining the positions he obtained, being generally averse to doing anything except what he was absolutely obliged to do. He had lost a situation in a dry goods store in Sixth Avenue because he objected to carrying bundles, considering it beneath the dignity of a gentleman's son. Some months before, he had tried to get Richard Hunter discharged from his situation in the hope of succeeding him in it, but this plot proved utterly unsuccessful, as is fully described in Fame and Fortune. We shall have more to do with Roswell Crawford in the course of the present story. At present, he was employed in a retail bookstore uptown on a salary of $6 a week. Chapter 8. On the Ferry Boat Mark had made two applications for charity and still had but 10 cents. The manner in which Mrs. Crawford met his appeal made the business seem more disagreeable than ever. Besides, he was getting tired. It was not more than 8 o'clock, but he had been up early and had been on his feet all day. He leaned against one of the stalls, but in so doing, he aroused the suspicions of the vigilant old woman who presided over it. "'Just stand away there,' she said. "'You're watching for a chance to steal one of them apples.' "'No, I'm not,' said Mark indignantly. "'I never steal.' "'Don't tell me,' said the old woman, who had a hearty aversion to boys. 
some of whom, it must be confessed, had in times past played mean tricks on her. Don't tell me. Them that beg will steal, and I see you begging just now. To this, Mark had no reply to make. He saw that he was already classed with the young street beggars, many of whom, as the old woman implied, had no particular objection to stealing, if they got a chance. Altogether, he was so disgusted with his new business that he felt it impossible for him to beg any more that night. But then came up the consideration that this would prevent his returning home. He very well knew what kind of a reception Mother Watson would give him, and he had a very unpleasant recollection and terror of the leather strap. But where should he go? He must pass the night somewhere, and he already felt drowsy. Why should he not follow Ben Gibson's suggestions and sleep on the Fulton ferry boat? It would only cost two cents to get on board, and he might ride all night. Fortunately, he had more than money enough for that, though he did not like to think how he came by the ten cents. When Mark had made up his mind, he passed out of one of the entrances of the market, and crossing the street, presented his ten cents at the wicket, where stood the fare taker. Without a look towards him, that functionary took the money, and pushed back eight cents. These Mark took and passed round into the large room of the ferry house. The boat was not in, but he already saw it halfway across the river, speeding towards its pier. There were a few persons waiting besides himself, but the great rush of travel was diminished for a short time. It would set in again about eleven o'clock, when those who had passed the evening at some place of amusement in New York would be on their way home. Mark, with the rest, waited till the boat reached its wharf. There was the usual bump, then the chain rattled, the wheel went round, and the passengers began to pour out upon the wharf. Mark passed into the boat and went at once to the gentleman's cabin, situated on the left-hand side of the boat. Generally, however, gentlemen rather unfairly crowd into the ladies' cabin, sometimes compelling the ladies to whom it of right belongs to stand while they complacently monopolize the seats. The gentlemen's cabin, so called, is occupied by those who have a little more regard to the rights of ladies and by the smokers, who are at liberty to indulge in their favorite comfort here. When Mark entered, the air was redolent with tobacco smoke generally emitted from clay pipes and cheap cigars, and therefore not so agreeable as under other circumstances it might have been. But it was warm and comfortable, and that was a good deal. In the corner, Mark espied a wide seat, nearly double the size of an ordinary seat, and this, he decided, would make the most comfortable niche for him. He settled himself down there as well as he could. The seat was hard and not so comfortable as it might have been, but then Mark was not accustomed to beds of down, and he was so weary that his eyes closed and he was soon in the land of dreams. He was dimly conscious of the arrival at the Brooklyn side, and the ensuing hurried exit of passengers from what part of the cabin he was in. But it was only a slight interruption, and when the boat, having set out on its homeward trip, reached the New York side, he was fast asleep. Poor little fellow, thought more than one, with a hasty glance at the sleeping boy. He is taking his comfort where he can. But there was no good Samaritan to take him by the hand, and inquire into his hardships, and provide for his necessities, or rather there was one, and that one well known to us. Richard Hunter and his friend Henry Fosdick had been to Brooklyn that evening to attend an instructive lecture, which they had seen announced in one of the daily papers. The lecture concluded at half-past nine, and they took the ten o'clock boat over the Fulton Ferry. They seated themselves in the first cabin towards the Brooklyn side, and did not therefore see Mark until they passed through the other cabin on the arrival of the boat at New York. "'Look there, Fosdick,' said Richard Hunter. "'See that poor little chap asleep in the corner?' Doesn't it remind you of the times we used to have when we were as badly off as he? Yes, Dick, but I don't think I ever slept on a ferry boat. That's because you were not on the streets long. I took care of myself eight years, and more than once took a cheap bed for two cents on a boat like this. Most likely I have slept in that very corner. It was a hard life, Dick. Yes, and a hard bed, too, but there's a good many that are no better off now. I always feel like doing something to help along those like this little chap here. I wonder what he is. A boot black? He hasn't got any brush or box with him. Perhaps he's a newsboy. I think I'll give him a surprise. Wake him up, do you mean? No, poor little chap. Let him sleep. I'll put fifty cents in his pocket, and when he wakes up, he won't know where it came from. That's a good idea, Dick. I'll do the same, all right? Here's the money. Put mine in with yours. Don't wake him up. Dick walked softly up to the match boy and gently inserted the money, one dollar, in one of the pockets of his ragged vest. Mark was so fast asleep that he was entirely unconscious of the benevolent act. That'll make him open his eyes in the morning, he said, unless somebody relieves him of the money during his sleep. 
Not much chance of that. Pickpockets won't be very apt to meddle with such a ragged little chap as that, unless it's in a fit of temporary aberration of mind. You're right, Dick, but we must hurry out now, or we shall be carried back to Brooklyn. And so get more than our money's worth. I wouldn't want to cheat the corporation so extensively as that. So the two friends passed out of the boat and left the match-boy asleep in the cabin, quite unconscious that good fortune had hovered over him, and made him richer by a dollar while he slept. While we are waiting for him to awake, we may as well follow Richard Hunter and his friend home. Fosdick's good fortune, which we recorded in the earlier chapters of this volume, had made no particular change in their arrangements. They were already living in better style than was usual among youths situated as they were. There was this difference, however, that whereas formerly Dick paid the greater part of the joint expense, it was now divided equally. It will be remembered that Fosdick's interest in the twenty bank shares purchased in his name amounted to one hundred and sixty dollars annually, and this just about enabled him to pay his own way, though not leaving him a large surplus for clothing and incidental expenses. It could not be long, however, before his pay would be increased at the store, probably by two dollars a week. Until that time he could economize a little, for upon one thing he had made up his mind— not to trench upon his principal except in case of sickness or absolute necessity. The boys had not forgotten or neglected the commission which they had undertaken for Mr. Hiram Bates. They had visited on the evening after he left the newsboy's lodging house, then located at the corner of Fulton and Nassau Streets, in the upper part of the Sun Building, and had consulted Mr. O'Connor, the efficient superintendent, as to the boy of whom they were in search. But he had no information to supply them with. He promised to inquire among the boys who frequented the lodge, as it was possible that there might be some among them who might have fallen in with a boy named Talbot. Richard Hunter also sought out some of his old acquaintances, who were still engaged in blacking boots or selling newspapers, and offered a reward of five dollars for the discovery of a boy of ten named Talbot, or John Talbot. As a result of this offer, a red-haired boy was brought round to the counting-room one day, who stoutly asserted that his name was John Talbot, and his guide in consequence claimed the reward. Dick, however, had considerable doubt as to the genuineness of this claim, and called the errand boy, known to the readers of earlier volumes, as Mickey McGuire. Mickey, said Richard, this boy says he is John Talbot. Do you know him? Know him, repeated Mickey. I've knowed him ever since he was so high. He's no more John Talbot than I am. His name is Tim Hogan, and I'll defy him to say it isn't. Tim looked guilty, and his companion gave up the attempt to obtain the promised reward. He had hired Tim by the promise of a dollar to say he was John Talbot, hoping by the means to clear four dollars for himself. That boy will rise to a seat in the common council if he lives long enough, said Dick. He's an unusually promising specimen. End of section four. Recording by Tori Falder. Section five of Mark the Match Boy, or Richard Hunter's Ward. By Horatio Algers, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tori Falder. Chapter 9. A Pleasant Discovery. The night wore away, and still Mark the Match Boy continued to sleep soundly in the corner of the cabin where he had established himself. One of the boat hands passing through noticed him, and was on the point of waking him, but, observing his weary look and thin attire, refrained from an impulse of compassion. He had a boy of about the same age, and the thought came to him that some time his boy might be placed in the same situation, and this warmed his heart towards the little vagrant. I suppose I ought to wake him up, he reflected, but he isn't doing any harm there, and he may as well have his sleep out. So Mark slept on, a merciful sleep, in which he forgot his poverty and friendless condition, a sleep which brought new strength and refreshment to his limbs. When he woke up, it was six o'clock in the morning, but it was quite dark still, for it was in December, and, so far as appearances went, it might have been midnight. But already sleepy men and boys were on their way to the great city to their daily work. Some were employed a considerable distance uptown and must be at their posts at seven. Others were employed in the markets and must be stirring at an early hour. There were keepers of street stands who liked to be ready for the first wave in the tide of daily travel that was to sweep without interruption through the city streets until late at night. So, altogether, even at this early hour, there was quite a number of passengers. Mark rubbed his eyes, not quite sure where he was or how he got there. He half expected to hear the harsh voice of Mother Watson, which usually aroused him to his daily toil. But there was no Mother Watson to be seen, only sleepy, gaping men and boys clad in working dresses. 
Mark sat up and looked around him. "'Well, young chap, you've had a nap, haven't you?' said a man at his side, who appeared from a strong smell of paint about his clothes to be a journeyman painter. "'Yes,' said Mark. "'Is it morning?' "'To be sure it is. What did you expect it was?' "'Then I've been sleeping all night,' said the match-boy, in surprise. "'Where?' "'Here.' "'In that corner?' asked the painter. "'Yes,' said Mark. "'I came aboard last night and fell asleep, and that's the last I remember.' "'It must be rather hard to the bones,' said the painter. "'I think that I should prefer a regular bed.' "'I do feel rather sore,' said the match-boy, "'but I slept bully. "'A little chap like you can curl up anywhere. "'I don't think I could sleep very well on these seats. "'Haven't you got any home?' "'Yes,' said Mark. "'A sort of home.' "'Then why didn't you sleep at home?' "'I knew I should get a beating if I went home without twenty-five cents.' "'Well, that's hard luck. I wonder how I should feel,' he continued laughing, "'if my wife gave me a beating when I came home short of funds.' But here the usual bump indicated the arrival of the boat at the slip, and all the passengers, the painter included, rose and hurried to the edge of the boat. With the rest went Mark. He had no particular object in going thus early, but his sleep was over, and there was no inducement to remain longer in the boat. The rain was over also, the streets were still wet from the effects of the quantity that had fallen, but there was no prospect of any more. Mark's wet clothes had dried in the warm, dry atmosphere of the cabin, and he felt considerably better than on the evening previous. Now, however, he could not help wondering what Mother Watson had thought of his absence. She'll be mad, I know, he thought. I suppose she'll whip me when I get back. This certainly was not a pleasant thought. The leather strap was an old enemy of his, which he dreaded, and with good reason. He was afraid that he would get a more severe beating for not having returned the night before at the hands of the angry old woman. I wish I didn't live with Mother Watson, he thought. Straight upon his thought came another. Why should he? Mother Watson had no claim upon him. Upon his mother's death she had assumed the charge of him, but, as it turned out, rather for her own advantage than his. She had taken all his earnings and given him in return a share of her miserable apartment, a crust of bread or two, daily seasoned with occasional assaults with the leather strap. It had never occurred to Mark before, but now for the first time it dawned upon him that he had the worst of the bargain. He could live more comfortably by retaining his earnings and spending them upon himself. Mark was rather a timid and mild-mannered boy, or he would sooner have rebelled against the tyranny and abuse of Mother Watson. But he had had little confidence in himself and wanted somebody to lean on. In selecting the old woman, who had acted thus far as his guardian, he had leaned upon a broken reed. The last night's experience gave him a little courage. He reflected that he could sleep in the newsboy's lodging house for five cents, or on the ferry boat again for two, while the fare at his old home was hardly so sumptuous, but that he could obtain the same without very large expense. So Mark thought seriously of breaking his yoke and declaring himself free and independent. A discovery which he made confirmed him in his half-formed resolution. He remembered that after paying his toll he had eight cents left, which he had placed in his vest pocket. He thought that these would enable him to get some breakfast, and drew them out. To his astonishment there were two silver half-dollars mingled with the coppers. Mark opened his eyes wide in astonishment. Where could they have come from? Was it possible that the tollman had given him them by mistake for pennies? That could not be, for two reasons. First, he remembered looking at the change as it was handed him, and he knew there were no half-dollars among them. Again, the eight pennies were all there, the silver coins making the number ten. It was certainly very strange and surprising, and puzzled Mark not a little. We, who know all about it, find the explanation very easy, but to the little match-boy it was an unfathomable mystery. The surprise, however, was of an agreeable character. With so much money in his possession, Mark felt like a man with a handsome balance at his banker's, and with the usual elasticity of youth he did not look forward to the time when this supply would be exhausted. I won't go back to Mother Watson, he determined. She's beaten me times enough. I'll take care of myself. While these thoughts were passing through his mind, he had walked up Fulton Street and reached the corner of Nassau. Here he met his friend of the night before, Ben Gibson. Ben looked rather sleepy. He had been at the old Bowery Theatre the night before until twelve o'clock, and, having no money left to invest in a night's lodging, he had crept into a corner of the Times printing office and slept, but had not quite slept off his fatigue. Hello, young'un, he said. Where'd you come from? The Fulton Ferry, said Mark. I slept on the boat. Did you? How'd you like it? Pretty good, said Mark. It was rather hard. How'd you make out begging? Not very well. I got ten cents. 
So you didn't dare go home to the old woman? I shan't go home there any more, said the match boy. Do you mean it? Yes, I do. Bully for you. I like your pluck. I wouldn't go back and get a licking if I were you. What'll Mother Watson say? She'll be mad, I expect, said Mark. Keep a sharp lookout for her. I'll tell you what you can do. Stay near me, and if she comes prowling round, I'll manage her. Could you, said Mark quickly, who, from certain recollections, had considerable fear of his stout tyrant. You may just bet on that. What's she going to do? I think I shall go and get some breakfast, said Mark. So would I, if I had any tin, but I'm dead broke. Spent my last cent going to the old Bowery. I'll have to wait till I've had one or two shines before I can eat breakfast. Are you hungry? I'll bet I am. Because, said Mark, hesitating, I'll lend you money enough for breakfast, and you can pay me when you earn it. You lend me money, exclaimed Ben in astonishment. Why, you haven't got but eight cents. Yes, I have, said Mark, producing the two half dollars. Where'd you get them? asked the boot black in unfeigned surprise, looking at Mark as if he had all at once developed into an aster or a steward. You haven't been begging this morning, have you? No, said the match boy, and I don't mean to beg again if I can help it. Then where'd you get the money? I don't know. Don't know? You haven't been stealing, have you? Mark disclaimed the imputation indignantly. Then you found a pocketbook? No, I didn't. Then where did you get the money? I don't know any more than you do. When I went to sleep on the boat, I didn't have it. But this morning, when I felt in my pocket, it was there. That's mighty queer, said Ben, whistling. So I think. It's good money, ain't it? Try it and see. Ben tossed up one of the coins. It fell with a clear ringing sound on the sidewalk. Yes, that's good, he said. I just wish somebody'd treat me that way. Maybe it's the vest. If tis, I'd like to buy it. I don't think it's that, said Mark, laughing. Anyway, you've got the money. I'll borrow twenty cents of you, and we'll go and get some breakfast. Chapter 10. On the Warpath. Ben led the way to a cheap restaurant, where for eighteen cents each of the boys got a breakfast, which to their not very fastidious taste proved very satisfactory. There, said Ben with a sigh of satisfaction as they rose from the table. Now I feel like work. I'll pay up that money a fortnight. All right, said Mark. What are you going to do? I don't know, said Mark irresolutely. You're a match boy, ain't you? Yes. Where's your matches? In Mother Watson's room. You might go and get them when she's out. No, said Mark, shaking his head. I won't do that. Why not? You ain't afraid to go around there, be you? It isn't that, but the matches are hers, not mine. What's the odds? I won't take anything of hers. Well, you can buy some of your own then. You've got money enough. So I will, said Mark. It's lucky that money came to me in my sleep. That's a lucky boat. I guess I'll go there and sleep tonight. Mark did as he proposed. With the money he had, he was able to purchase a good supply of matches, and when it became light enough, he began to vend them. Hitherto, he had not been very fortunate in the disposal of his wares, being timid and bashful, but then he was working for Mother Watson, and expected to derive very little advantage for himself from his labors. Now he was working for himself, and this seemed to put new spirit and courage into him. Then again he felt that he had shaken off the hateful thraldrum in which Mother Watson had held him, and this gave him a hopefulness which he had not before possessed. The consequence was that at noon he found that he had earned forty cents in addition to his investment. At that time, too, Ben was ready to pay him his loan, so that Mark found himself twenty-two cents better off than he had been in the morning, having a capital of a dollar and thirty cents, out of which, however, he must purchase his dinner. While he is getting on in such an encouraging manner, we must go back to Mother Watson. When Mark did not return the night before, she grumbled considerably, but no thought of his intentional desertion dawned upon her. Indeed, she counted upon his timidity and lack of courage, knowing well that a more spirited boy would have broken her chain long before. She only thought, therefore, that he had not got the twenty-five cents and did not dare come back, especially as she had forbidden him to do so. So, determining to give him a taste of the leather strap in the morning, she went to bed, first taking a fresh potation from the whiskey bottle, which was her constant companion. Late in the morning, Mother Watson woke, feeling as usual at that hour of the day, cross and uncomfortable, and with a strong desire to make someone else uncomfortable too. But Mark, whom she usually made to bear the burden of her temper, was still away. For the first time, the old woman began to feel a little apprehensive that he had deserted her. 
This was far from suiting her, as she found his earnings very convenient, and found it besides pleasant to have somebody to scold. She hastily dressed, without paying much attention to her toilette. Indeed, to do Mother Watson justice, her mind was far from being filled with the vanity of dress, and if she erred on that subject, it was in the opposite extreme. When her simple toilette was accomplished, she went downstairs and knocked at Mrs. Flanagan's door. "'Come in,' said a hearty voice. Mrs. Flanagan was hard at work at her wash-tub, and had been for a good couple of hours. She raised her good-natured face as the old woman entered. "'The top of the morning to you, Mother Watson,' she said. "'I hope you're in fine health this morning, Mum." "'Then you'll be disappointed,' said Mrs. Watson. "'I've got a bad feeling in my stomach, and I have it most every morning.' "'It's the whiskey,' thought Mrs. Flanagan, but she thought it best not to intimate as much as it might lead to hostilities. "'Better take a cup of tea,' said she. "'I haven't got any,' said the old woman. "'I wouldn't mind a sup if you've got some handy.' "'Sit down, then,' said Mrs. Flanagan hospitably. "'I've got some left from breakfast, only it's cold, but if you'll wait a bit I'll warm it over for you.' Nothing loath, Mother Watson sank into a chair and began to give a full account of her ailments to her neighbor, who tried hard to sympathize with her, though knowing the cause of the ailments, she found this rather difficult. "'Have you seen anything of my boy this morning?' she asked after a while. "'What, Mark?' said Mrs. Flanagan. "'Didn't he come home last night?' "'No,' said the old woman, "'and he isn't home yet. When he does come, I'll give him a dose of the strap. He's a bad, lazy, shiftless boy and worries my life out.' "'You're hard on the poor boy, Mother Watson. "'You must remember he's but a wisp of a lad and hasn't much strength.' "'He's strong enough,' muttered Mother Watson. "'It's lazy he is. Just let him come home, that's all.' "'You told him not to come home unless he had twenty-five cents to bring with him.' "'So I did. And why didn't he do it?' "'He couldn't get the money, it's likely, and he's afraid of being bait.' "'Well, he will be bait then, Mrs. Flanagan. You may be sure of that, said the old woman, diving her hand into her pocket to see that the strap was safe. Then you're a bad, cruel woman to bait that poor motherless child, said Mrs. Flanagan with spirit. Say that again, Mrs. Flanagan, ejaculated Mother Watson irefully. My hearing isn't as good as it was, and maybe I didn't hear you right. No wonder your hearing isn't good, said Mrs. Flanagan, who now broke bounds completely. I shouldn't think you'd have any sense left with the whiskey you drink. "'Perhaps you mean to insult me,' said the old woman, glaring at her hostess with one of the frowns which used to send terror to the heart of poor Mark. "'Take it as you please, Mum," said Mrs. Flanagan intrepidly. "'I'm entirely willin'. I've been wanting to spake my mind a long while, and now I've spoke it.' Mother Watson clutched the end of the strap in her pocket, and eyed her hostess with a half-wish that it would do to treat her as she had treated Mark so often. But Mrs. Flanagan, with her strong arms and sturdy frame, looked like an antagonist not very easily overcome, and Mrs. Watson forbore, though unwillingly. Meanwhile, the tea was beginning to emit quite a savory odor, and the wily old woman thought it best to change her tactics. Accordingly, she burst into tears, and rocking backward and forward, declared that she was a miserable old woman, and hadn't a friend in the world, and succeeded in getting up such a display of misery that the soft heart of Mrs. Flanagan was touched, and she apologized for the unpleasant personal observations she had made, and hoped Mother Watson would take the tea. To this, Mother Watson finally agreed, and intimating that she was faint, Mrs. Flanagan made some toast for her, of which the cunning old woman partook with exceeding relish, notwithstanding her state of unhappiness. "'Come in any time, Mother Watson,' said Mrs. Flanagan, "'when you want a sip of tea, and I'll be glad to have you take some with me.' "'Thank you, Mrs. Flanagan. Maybe I'll look in once in a while. A sip of tea goes to the right spot when I feel bad at my stomach. "'Must you be going, Mother Watson?' Yes, said the old woman, I'm going out on a little walk to see my sister that keeps a candy stand by the park railings. If Mark comes in, will you tell him he'd find the matches upstairs? This Mrs. Flanagan promised to do, and the old woman went downstairs and into the street. But she had not stated her object quite correctly. It was true that she had a sister, who was in the confectionery and apple line, presiding over one of the stalls beside the park railings. But the two sisters were not on very good terms, chiefly because the candy merchant, who was more industrious and correct in her habits than her sister, declined to lend money to Mother Watson, a refusal which led to a perfect coolness between them. It was not, therefore, to see her that the old woman went out. She wanted to find Mark. She did not mean to lose her hold upon him, if there was any chance of retaining it, and she therefore made up her mind to visit the places where he was commonly to be found, and when found, to bring him home, by violence, if necessary. 
So, with an old plaid cloak depending from her broad shoulders and her hand grasping the strap in her pocket, she made her way to the square, peering about on all sides with her ferret-like eyes in the hope of discovering the missing boy. End of section 5 of Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. Recording by Tori Falder. Section 6 of Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tori Falder. Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger, Jr. Chapter 11. Mark's Victory. Meanwhile, Mark, rejoicing in his newfound freedom, had started on a business walk among the stores and offices at the lower part of Nassau Street, and among the law and banking offices of Wall Street. Fortunately for Mark, there had been a rise in stocks, and Wall Street was in a good humor. So a few of the crumbs from the tables of the prosperous bankers and brokers fell in his way. One man, who had just realized $10,000 on a rise in some railway securities, handed Mark 50 cents, but declined to take any of his wares. So this was all clear profit and quite a windfall for the little match boy. Again, in one or two cases, he received double price for some of his matches, and the result was that he found himself by eleven o'clock, the possessor of two dollars and a quarter, with a few boxes of matches still left. Mark could hardly realize his own good fortune. Somehow it seemed a great deal more profitable, as well as more agreeable, to be in business for himself than to be acting as the agent of Mother Watson. Mark determined that he would never go back to her unless he was actually obliged to do so. He wanted somebody to sympathize with him in his good fortune, and, as he had nearly sold out, he determined to hunt up Ben Gibson and inform him of his run of luck. Ben, as he knew, was generally to be found on Nassau Street, somewhere near the corner of Spruce Street. He therefore turned up Nassau Street from Wall, and in five minutes he reached the business stand of his friend Ben. Ben had just finished up a job as Mark came up. His patron was a young man of verdant appearance, who, it was quite evident, hailed from the country. He wore a blue coat with brass buttons and a tall hat in the style of ten years before, with an immense top. He gazed with complacency at the fine polish which Ben had imparted to his boots, a pair of stout cowhides, and inquired with an assumption of indifference. "'Well, boy, what's the tax?' Twenty-five cents,' said Ben coolly. Twenty-five cents!' ejaculated the customer with a gasp of amazement. "'Come now, you're joking.' "'No, I ain't,' said Ben. "'You don't mean to say you charge twenty-five cents for five minutes' work?' "'Regular price,' said Ben. "'Why, I don't get but twelve and a half cents an hour when I work out haying,' said the young man in a tone expressive of his sense of the unfairness of the comparative compensation. "'Maybe you don't have to pay a big license,' said Ben." a license for black and boots ejaculated the countryman in surprise in course i have to deposit five hundred dollars more or less in the city treasury before i can black boots five hundred dollars repeated the customer opening his eyes wide at the information in course said ben if i didn't they'd put me in jail for a year and does he pay a license too asked the countryman pointing to mark who had just come up he only has to pay two hundred and fifty dollars said ben they ain't so hard on him as on us the young man drew out his wallet reluctantly and managed to raise twenty-three cents which he handed to ben i wouldn't have had my boots blacked if i'd known the price he said i could have blacked em myself at home they didn't cost but three dollars and it don't pay to give twenty-five cents to have em blacked it'll make em last twice as long said ben my blackin is the superiorest kind and keeps boots from wearin out i haven't got the other two cents said the young man ain't that near enough it'll do said ben magnanimously seeing you didn't know the price the victimized customer walked away gratified to have saved the two cents but hardly reconciled to have expended almost quarter of a dollar on a piece of work which he might have done himself before leaving home well what luck mark said ben i took in that chap neat didn't i but you didn't tell the truth said mark you don't have to buy a license oh what's the odds said ben whose ideas on the subject of truth were far from being strict it's all fair in business didn't that chap open his eyes when i told him about paying five hundred dollars i don't think it's right ben said mark seriously don't you go preachin mark said ben not altogether pleased you've been tied to an old woman's apron string too long that's what's the matter with you 
Mother Watson didn't teach me the truth, said Mark. She don't care whether I tell it or not except to her. It was my mother that told me I ought always to tell the truth. Women don't know anything about business, said Ben. Nobody in business speaks the truth. Do you see that sign? Mark looked across the street and saw a large placard setting forth that a stock of books and stationery was selling off at less than cost. Do you believe that? asked Ben. Perhaps it's true, said Mark. Then you're jolly green. That's all I've got to lay, said Ben. But you haven't told me how much you've made. See here, said Mark, and he drew out his stock of money. Woo! whistled Ben in amazement. You're in luck. I guess you've been speculating on your license, too. No, said Mark. One gentleman gave me fifty cents, and two others paid me double price. Why, you're getting rich, said Ben. Ain't you glad you left the old woman? But just then Mark lifted up his eyes and saw a sight that blanched his cheek. There, bearing down upon him, and already but a few feet distant, was Mother Watson. She was getting over the ground as fast as her stoutness would allow. She had already caught sight of Mark, and her inflamed eyes were sparkling with triumphant joy. Mark saw with terror that her hand was already feeling in the pocket where she kept the leather strap. Much as he always feared the strap, the idea of having it applied to him in the public street made it even more distasteful. "'What shall I do, Ben?' he said, clutching the arm of his companion. "'What are you afraid of? Do you see a cop after you?' A cop is the street boy's name for a policeman. No, said Mark. There's Mother Watson coming after me. Don't you see her? That's Mother Watson, is it, asked Ben, surveying the old body with a critical eye. She's a beauty, she is. What shall I do, Ben? She'll beat me. No, she won't, said Ben. You just keep quiet and leave her to me. Don't be afraid. She shan't touch you. She might strike you, said Mark apprehensively. She'd better not, said Ben very decidedly. Not unless she wants to be landed in the middle of next week at very short notice. By this time, Mother Watson came up puffing and panting with the extraordinary efforts she had made. She could not speak at first, but stood and glared at the match boy in a vindictive way. What's the matter with you, old lady? asked Ben coolly. You ain't took sick, be you? I'd offer to support your delicate form, but I'm afraid you'd be too much for me. What do you mean by running away from home, you little thief, said the old woman at length, regaining her breath. Of course, her remark was addressed to Mark. You're very polite, old lady, said Ben, but I've adopted that boy, and he's going to live with me now. I ain't speaking to you, you vagabone, said Mother Watson, so you needn't give me no more of your impertinence. I'm a-speaking to him. I'm not going to live with you any more, said Mark gaining a little courage from the coolness of his friend, the boot-black. "'Ain't a-goin' to live with me,' gasped the old woman, who could hardly believe she'd heard aright. "'Come right away, sir, or I'll drag you home.' "'Don't you stir, Mark,' said Ben. Mother Watson drew out her strap and tried to get at the match-boy, but Ben put himself persistently in her way. "'Clear out, you vagabone,' said the old lady, "'or I'll give you something to make you quiet.' "'You'd better keep quiet yourself,' said Ben, not in the least frightened. "'Don't you be afraid, Mark. "'If she kicks up a rumpus, I'll give her over to a cop. "'He'll settle her.' "'Mother Watson, by this time, was very much incensed. "'She pulled out her strap and tried to get at Mark, "'but the boot black foiled her efforts constantly. "'Carried away with anger, she struck Ben with the strap. "'Look here, old lady,' said Ben. "'That's going a little too far. "'You won't use that strap again.' and with a dexterous and vigorous grasp, he pulled it out of her hand. "'Give me that strap, you vagabone!' screamed the old woman furiously. "'Look here, old lady, what are you up to?' demanded the voice of one having authority. Mother Watson, turning around, saw an object for which she never had much partiality, a policeman. "'Oh, sir,' she said, bursting into maudlin tears, "'it's my bad boy that I want to come home, and he won't come.' "'Which is your boy? That one?' asked the policeman, pointing to Ben Gibson. "'No, not that vagabone,' said the old woman spitefully. "'I wouldn't own him. It's that other boy.' "'Do you belong to her?' asked the officer, addressing Mark. "'No, sir,' said the match boy. "'He does,' vociferated the old woman. "'Is he your son?' "'No,' she said, after a moment's hesitation. "'Is he any relation of yours?' "'Yes, he's my nephew,' said Mother Watson, making up her mind to a falsehood as the only means of recovering Mark. "'Is this true?' asked the officer. 
No, it isn't, said Mark. She's no relation to me, but when my mother died, she offered to take care of me. Instead of that, she's half starved me and beaten me with a strap when I didn't bring home as much money as she wanted. Then you don't want to go back with her? No, I'm going to take care of myself. Is there anybody that will prove the truth of what you say? Yes, said Mark. I'll call Mrs. Flanagan. Who is she? She lives in the same house with us. Shall he call her, or will you give him up? asked the officer. By the way, I think you're the same woman I saw drunk in the street last week. Mother Watson took alarm at this remark, and muttering that it was hard upon a poor widow woman to take her only nephew from her, shuffled off, leaving Mark and Ben in full possession of the field, with the terrible strap thrown in as a trophy of the victory they had won. I know her of old, said the policeman. I guess you'll do as well without her as with her. Satisfied that there would be no more trouble, he resumed his walk, and Mark felt that now in truth he was free and independent. As Mother Watson will not reappear in this story, it may be said that only a fortnight later she was arrested for an assault upon her sister, the proprietor of the apple stand, from whom she had endeavored in vain to extort a loan, and was sentenced to the island for a period of three months, during which she ceased to grace metropolitan society. Chapter 12. The Newsboy's Lodging House. When Mother Watson had turned the corner, Mark breathed a sigh of relief. "'Don't you think she'll come back again?' he asked anxiously of Ben Gibson. No, said Ben. She is scared of the cop. If she ever catches you alone and tries to come any of her games, just call a cop and she'll be in a hurry to leave. Well, said Mark, I guess I'll try to sell the rest of my matches. I haven't got but a few. All right, I'll try for another shine and then we'll go and have some dinner. I'd like to get hold of another greeny. Mark started with his few remaining matches. The feeling that he was his own master and had a little hoard of money for present expenses gave him courage, and he was no longer deterred by his usual timidity. In an hour he had succeeded in getting rid of all his matches, and he was now the possessor of two dollars and seventy-five cents, including the money Ben Gibson owed him. Ben also was lucky enough to get two ten-cent customers, which helped his receipts by twenty cents. Ben, it may be remarked, was not an advocate of the one-price system. He blacked boots for five cents when he could get no more. When he thought there was a reasonable prospect of getting ten cents, that was his price. Sometimes, as in the case of the young man from the rural districts, he advanced his fee to 25 cents. I don't approve of Ben's system for my part. I think it savors considerably of sharp practice and that fair prices in the long run are the best for all parties. The boys met again at one o'clock and adjourned to a cheap underground restaurant on Nassau Street, where they obtained what seemed to them a luxurious meal of beefsteak with a potato, a small plate of bread, and a cup of what went by the name of coffee. The steak was not quite up to the same article at Delmonico's, and there might be some reasonable doubts as to whether the coffee was a genuine article. But, as neither of the boys knew the difference, we may quote Ben's familiar phrase and say, What's the odds? Indeed, the free and easy manner in which Ben threw himself back in his chair, and the condescending manner in which he assured the waiter that the steak was a prime article, could hardly have been surpassed in the most aristocratic circles. Well, Mark, have you had enough? asked Ben. Yes, said Mark. Well, I haven't, said Ben. I guess I'll have some puddin'. Look here, Johnny, to the colored waiter. Just bring a feller a plate of apple dump with both kinds of sauce. After giving this liberal order, Ben tilted his chair back and began to pick his teeth with his fork. He devoted himself with assiduity to the consumption of the pudding and concluded his expensive repast by the purchase of a two-cent cigar with which he ascended to the street. Better have a cigar, Mark, he said. No, thank you, said the match boy. I think I'd rather not. Oh, you're feared of being sick. You'll come to it in time. All businessmen smoke. It is unnecessary to dwell upon the events of the afternoon. Mark was satisfied with the result of his morning's work and waited about with Ben till the close of the afternoon when the question came up as to where the night should be passed. I guess we'd better go to the lodge, said Ben. Were you ever there? No, said Mark. Well, come along. They'll give us a jolly bed, all for six cents, and there's a good warm room to stay in. Then we can get breakfast in the morning for six cents more. All right, said Mark. We'll go. The downtown newsboy's lodging house was at that time located at the corner of Fulton and Nassau streets. It occupied the fifth and sixth stories of the building then known as the Sun Building, owned by Moses S. Beach, the publisher of that journal. In the year 1868, circumstances rendered it expedient to remove the lodge to a building in Park Place. It is to be hoped that at some day not far distant, the Children's Aid Society, who carry on this beneficent institution, 
will be able to erect a building of their own in some eligible locality which can be permanently devoted to a purpose so praiseworthy. Ben and Mark soon reached the entrance to the lodge on Fulton Street. They ascended several flights of narrow stairs till they reached the top story. Then, opening a door at the left, they found themselves in the main room of the lodge. It was a low studded room of considerable dimensions, amply supplied with windows, looking out on Fulton and Nassau streets. At the side nearest the door was a low platform, separated from the rest of the room by a railing. On this platform were a table and two or three chairs. This was the place for the superintendent and for gentlemen who, from time to time, addressed the boys. The superintendent at that time was Mr. Charles O'Connor, who still retains the office. Probably no one could be found better adapted to the difficult task of managing the class of boys who avail themselves of the good offices of the newsboy's home. His mild yet firm manner, and more than all the conviction that he is their friend, and feels a hearty interest in their welfare, secure a degree of decorum and good behavior which could hardly be anticipated. Oaths and vulgar speech, however common in the street, are rarely heard here, or, if heard, meet with instant rebuke. The superintendent was in the room when Ben and Mark entered. "'Well, Ben, what luck have you had today? said Mr. O'Connor. "'Pretty good,' said Ben. "'And who is that with you?' "'Mother Watson's nephew,' said Ben, with a grimace. "'He's only joking, sir,' said Mark. "'My name is Mark Manton.' "'I am glad to see you, Mark,' said the superintendent. "'What is your business?' "'I sell matches, sir.' "'Have you parents living?' "'No, sir. They are both dead.' "'Where have you been living?' "'In Vandewater Street?' "'With anyone?' "'Yes, with a woman they call Mother Watson.' "'Is she a relation of yours?' "'No, sir,' said Mark hastily. "'What sort of a woman is she?' "'Bad enough, sir. She gets drunk about every day "'and used to beat me with the strap "'when I did not bring home as much money as she expected.' "'So you have left her?' "'Yes, sir. "'Have you ever been up here before?' "'No, sir. "'I suppose you know the rules of the place.' "'Yes, sir. Ben has told me.' "'You had better go and wash. We shall have supper pretty quick. "'Have you any money?' "'Yes, sir.' "'Mark took out his hoard of money and showed it to the superintendent, "'who was surprised at the amount. "'How did you get so much?' he asked. "'Part of it was given me,' said Mark. "'What are you going to do with it? You don't need it all. "'Will you keep it for me, sir? "'I will put as much of it as you can spare into the bank for you. "'This is our bank.' "'He pointed to a table beside the railing on the outside.' The top of it was pierced with narrow slits, each having a number attached. Each compartment was assigned to any boy who desired it, and his daily earnings were dropped in at the end of the day. Once a month the bank was opened, and the depositor was at liberty to withdraw his savings if he desired it. This is an excellent arrangement, as it has tendency to teach frugal habits to the young patrons of the lodge. Extravagance is one of their besetting sins. Many average a dollar and over as daily earnings, yet are always ragged and out at elbows, and often are unsupplied with the small price of a night's lodging at the home. The money is squandered on gambling, cigars, and theater going, while the same sum would make them comfortable and independent of charity. The disposition to save is generally the first encouraging symptom in a street boy, and shows that he really has a desire to rise above the circumstances and gain a respectable position in the world. Ben, who had long frequented the lodging house off and on, led the way to the washing room, where Mark, to his satisfaction, was able to cleanse himself from the dust and impurity of the street. At Mother Watson's he had had no accommodations of the kind, as the old lady was not partial to water, either internally or externally. He was forced to snatch such opportunities as he could find. Now, said Ben, we'll go into the gymnasium. A room opposite the main room had been fitted up with a few of the principal appliances of a gymnasium, and these were already in use by quite a number of boys. Mark looked on but did not participate, partly from bashfulness and partly because he did not very well understand the use of the different appliances. "'How do you like it?' asked Ben. "'Very much,' said Mark, with satisfaction. "'I'm glad you brought me here. "'I'll show you the beds by and by,' said Ben. The rooms on the floor below were used for lodging. Tiers of neat beds, some like those in a steamboat or a hospital, filled a large room. They were very neat in appearance and looked comfortable.' In order to ensure their continuing neat, the superintendent requires such as need it to wash their feet before retiring to bed. The supper was, of course, plain, but of good quality and sufficient quantity. About nine o'clock, Mark got into the neat bed which was assigned him, and felt that it was more satisfactory even than the cabin of a Brooklyn ferry boat. He slept peacefully except towards morning, when he dreamed that his old persecutor, Mother Watson, was about to apply the dreaded strap. He woke up terrified but soon realized with deep satisfaction that he was no longer in her clutches.
End of section six of Mark the Match Boy or Richard Hunter's Ward by Horatio Alger Jr. Recording by Tori Falder.